Hi everyone. Welcome to the final day of Earth Science Week 2020. Um, my name is Stephanie Lukowski. I'm the Curator of Education for Museums of Western Colorado. And this entire week we've had a lot of really great events that we've co-hosted with um, the Colorado Canyons Association as well as the BLM. And today is International Archaeology Day and it's the very last day of this great week that celebrates all things um, geoscience. So we have a great speaker for you tonight. Zebulon Miracle is going to talk to us about rock art. Um, before I get into that though, I'd like to ask you all, or at least everyone except for Zeb, to um, keep yourselves muted and keep your microphone off. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end of the talk. Um, otherwise, um, yeah, just sit back and relax. Um, this, um, the, tonight we're recording, so this, talk will be made available to all of you as well as to District 51 and any other interesting interested parties um, after the fact. So with that, um, let me introduce our speaker for the evening and then I can hand it off to him. Um, so Zebulon Miracle, he's a um, Western Colorado native. He's currently the executive director of the United Way of Mesa County um, and he's on the um, board for um, Music Spark and Visit Grand Junction. However, he spent a dozen years here at Museums of Western Colorado um, in various curatorial positions and five years at the Gateway Canyons overseeing the educational programming at the Gateway Auto Museum. Um, he also has volunteered on a number of boards, including uh, the City of Grand Junction Historic Preservation Board, the Community Food Bank of Grand Junction, Colorado Canyons Association, and the American Association of State and Local History Award of Merit Committee. Um, so we're really lucky to have him this evening and I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say. So um, Zeb, hopefully you're able to unmute yourself and turn on your camera and share screen and I will let you have it. So thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'm guessing everyone can see me okay at this point. Um, different software than what I'm used to working with. So if you'll pardon me for one quick second, I'm gonna make sure I can share my screen here. All right, I'm guessing we are up and going. Hopefully you guys can see my, um, my screen over there with the title of the talk. Um, it looks like Julia's here, so either Julia or Stephanie just, just ping my phone really quick. Hey, I got a nice little thumbs up from Stephanie there. So great, great. Well, thank you guys very much for joining me this evening. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, my name is Zebulon Miracle. I, I spent quite a bit of time over at um, Museums of Western Colorado, and I really appreciate them giving me the opportunity to speak with all of you this evening. Um, and rock art is something uh, uh, very um, near and dear and interesting and um, I think just fascinating. Um, for me. Um, I, I led quite a few rock art trips and excursions with the museum in my time there, as well as um, some research on rock art in the Gateway area. And I, I want to give a lot of credit for the museum for having um, a, a really well done rock art section on their website. If, if you haven't seen that, please check it out. Um, it, it's, a, it's a great website that goes over a lot of the, the basics of rock art. I'm going to touch just briefly on that a little bit tonight. But tonight I wanted to try something a little different. Tonight I wanted to try something a little new. And so um, you guys are kind of my guinea pigs for this. I, I hope it goes well, I'm, I'm sure it will. But tonight, instead of talking about just rock art as in um, what it is and, and different styles and different classifications, I wanted to talk about what I'm calling the historiography of rock art. And we'll get into what that means here in just a little bit. But what, what that means is tonight I'm going to go over just the very basics of as far as what rock art is so that we're using some same terminology throughout the talk. But really we're going to talk tonight a lot about how rock art has been viewed, how rock art has been studied, how rock art has been recorded um, for the last, uh, well, several centuries here in Western Colorado and the American West. 
And then I'd like to end the talk by talking about some of the, the cutting edge directions that rock art is going in. So for those of you that have been on one of my tours or have heard some of my rock art talks, this is going to be a little different for you. And again, a lot of this, let me really stress, is kind of some brand new research. This is a little project I've been working on on the side for about a year or so. So some of this is, is still kind of brand new being formed, but I'm excited to share some of that with you tonight. And, and hopefully you'll, you'll find it interesting and, and be able to take some of that with you. So let's dive right in. So just some real um, basic ideas behind rock art. Um, one of the things that I find most fascinating about rock art is that it's one of our oldest preserved forms of communication. The dates of rock art sites that we have is, is being pushed back and pushed back farther and farther. Um, one, we're, we're finding more and more rock art. And two, our, our abilities to, to date rock art are improving vastly. But you can find rock art all over the world, literally on every continent except Antarctica. And so rock art is both a very old and um, old form of communication. It's, it's something that's, that's very inherently us, but it's also very universal. And, and again, you see some images on your screen from Australia, from some extremely old rock art in some caves in India. You see rock art from Italy on there. You even see some species of extinct giraffe from, um, from Africa. So rock art, it, again, it's just this universal all over the place. I've used it for a very long time form of expression. Now, a couple of quick terms, and, and this is really rock art 101, but these are, these are terms that I'm going to be using throughout the evening tonight. So I want to make sure we're all on the same page with these. We, we classify, or you can break down rock art in, in a couple of different forms based on how it's created. One of the most common forms are petroglyphs. These are images that are carved away from stone. So you're taking something like a hammer stone and you're chiseling that image in, or you're simply scratching on the rock, but, but you're basically removing rock to create an image. And the most common place that we find this is in places with a lot of patina, that is a desert varnish or or staining on the rock that when you carve into that, you get a, um, a, another color and uh, the original color of the rock. So you get some high contrast. Over time, that patina will come back, that desert varnish will come back and images will become more and more faded. And that's one of our fun little tricks for, uh, for dating rock art. Rock art that is painted are called pictographs. Um, paint is, is usually ground up minerals. Um, you, usually things like uh, turquoise or gypsum. Um, you can use charcoal and you can use a binding agent like blood or sap or fat. And so it, you create this, um, this pigmentation out of ground up minerals, you use that binding agent and this paint can last an amazingly long amount of time here in the, the deserts of the American Southwest. So again, tonight when we may say petroglyphs, we're talking about images carved. Pictographs are images painted. But the really fun stuff comes here. We can break down types of images in a couple of different ways. The first is we can say an image is abstract. Um, abstract images are things that do not occur in nature. So if you find yourself saying, well, that kind of sort of looks like a blank, then it's an abstract image. The counter to that, of course, would be representational images. So these are images that you can easily identify. You can say that is a bighorn sheep, that is a deer, that is a person. Um, sometimes it can be heavily stylized, but you can go through and, and you can really come up with a, with a meaning. You can say that is a blank. It's, it's something that occurs in nature. We also have anthropomorphs, that is people-like images. Anthropology is the study of people, so it's easy to remember. And again, these can be very representational. You can look at it and say, wow, that is definitely a person. Or they can be a little abstract where it's, wow, you know, that's the, we can see a torso and I guess that's arms and that, that looks like perhaps a headdress. So you can have both abstract and representational anthropomorphs. And then the final little bit of terminology I want to run by you tonight are zoomorphs. Um, you go to the zoo to visit animals, and so zoomorphs are, are animal-like figures. And again, we can have both abstract and representational. On here, you can see a bighorn sheep, and on the bottom there in Dinosaur National Monument, these lizards are, are massive, are, are just huge. It's an amazing panel to see. 
So those are some phrases I'll be using throughout the night. Um, petroglyph, pictograph, abstract, representational, anthropomorph, pseudomorph. It's really easy to remember them. They're, they're not all that complicated when you break it down. And um, they can all kind of tie in um, uh, where needed. But one of the things that I really want to stress, and this is really important for tonight's talk, is that even abstract images have a meaning. Even if the meaning isn't very apparent as it is in a representational um, item or image, I, I really want to stress that to the person that created and the people that are using an abstract image, there's a meaning. So as you can see, our, our culture is filled with, with abstract images that we use all the time. Um, you, can, you all can look at these images and, and probably identify these brands or identify these meanings. Um, some of them are very, um, well, more or less obvious. You, you have an apple with a bite taken out. I, I, I suppose that, that that pretty much looks like an apple. Um, I have a four-year-old who watches a lot of Disney, but I've never really figured out how that looks like a mouse. But we've all kind of agreed that that is a mouse. And more than that, we have taken that abstract image, we've taken this abstract zoomorph, and, and we can tie so many things into it. When you see um, the Mickey Mouse icon, you, you think of everything Disney, which is, which is now an all-encompassing part of our culture. My favorite abstract image to, to use in, in discussions is the Nike swoosh down there. Um, that does not occur in nature. That is an image that we have assigned a meaning to. And when you see that Nike swoosh, um, you, you know exactly what's, what's going on. You, you think about Michael Jordan. You think about the Olympics. You think about sports. Um, so much comes to mind there. A um, few more of my favorite abstract images. Um, the human heart really doesn't look at all like that, but we have so many meanings tied to that symbol. That's, that's not just the human heart is in the organ, but also love overall. We use that on Valentine's Day. You have the peace symbol next to that. The mythology and story behind the, uh, the symbol that we use for medicine is a very complex story. And then we use abstract images to also just perform basic business. Um, um, I love the, the examples of different brands over there used in cattle. So this is a really important point. And this is an important point that's really going to tie in how we view rock art. And that is keeping in mind that abstract images have a meaning. So th those are just some important concepts that I really want to make sure everyone has nailed down. All right, let's move on. So another just quick overall thought. And, and again, we could, we could talk the entire 90 minutes on this chart, but I'm going to, to go through it quite quickly for you. The, the moral of the story on this chart is that people have lived in North America and South America for over 12,000 years. And we're pushing that number back, just like rock art. The, the better our science gets, the more sites that we find, the larger sample sizes we have. Um, our understanding of the past is being pushed farther and farther back. So the new world, North America, South America, does not have a young history. It has a very, very old history. And we have broken that history up into different chapters of different periods. And so in North America, in, in, in um, American Southwest archeology, span we talk about the Paleo-Indian era. Then about 7,000 years ago, we see a change in the environment and um, uh, the loss of megafauna, and we enter what we call the Archaic period. Um, about 2,000 years ago, we start entering into the basket maker period. About 1,500 years ago, the formative period, and these are some of the cultures that you're all very familiar with. And then um, we, we have the historic period, which is the, the first contact with Europeans. Don't worry about rem remembering all this for tonight. Um, again, if we had a longer rock art talk or, or um, some of the information that you can find on the museum's website, we'll break down the different rock art that we find in these periods and what it tells us about those periods. Rather, tonight, what I want to focus on is history, historiography. It's a hard word to say, but historiography is, is a couple of different things. It's, it's basically the study of historical writing, or a lot of people call it the history of history. Um, it really focuses on how history has been written by whom and why. Our, our views of history change over time. How we record history, why we record history, what we record in history changes. 
And it's not necessarily a study of rock art itself, but rather its analysis of how historians have interpreted rock art that we're going to be talking about this evening. And again, this is this is a, a kind of a, a, a new route, um, a, a, an interesting subject that I've been working on, it, again, for about a, a year now on and off. I'm, I'm really curious with how people have viewed rock art over time. When I was when I was leading a lot of rock art tours, um, by far the first question or the most common question that I get at rock art sites was, "Well, what does this all mean?" And I would uh, I've come to realize that that the answer and what it means is really closely related to how we've interpreted rock art as historians, as anthropologists, over time. So let me also stress a couple of things while we're here. Um, number one, again, this isn't me trying to answer for you what rock art means. Rather, this is me telling you um, what I have found in research as far as what other researchers have um, said rock art means or incorporated rock art into their study. So we're going to see how that view has changed. And number two, I really, really, really want to stress that some of the terminology and some of the language that's going to be used by our original sources here is not at all my views or opinions. So let, let's make sure to, to get that out there. Um, what I wanted to do ultimately was look back over the last 500 years of exploration in North America and really look at how early explorers viewed rock art, how the scientific community viewed rock art, and how those views have changed over time and um, really kind of catch you up to as far as where we're at today. So again, this talk is about rock art, but it's really how our understanding, how our use and how our views as historians and scientists, um, especially Western based have changed. So here's a whole bunch of text. Um, one of the big rules about um, doing a presentation is not bombard your audience with a big wall of text. So I do apologize for all this right away. Um, there is no test at the end of this either. But um, this is kind of a, a, your overall generic themes of how rock art has been viewed and used over the years. Um, people have always created rock art, as I mentioned, but it's interesting how recent it is in, in recorded history that people actually talked about old images or, or images that predated their remembrance. So um, in France, there's a series of caves um, with some absolutely spectacular rock art um, that was discovered. And people became, began questioning, well, well, who made this rock art? Where, where did this rock art come from? How could people that lived long ago have the sophistication to make this rock art? And in 1864, it was proposed that this rock art was art for the sake of art. And it was believed that early, quote, savage man could not have used this art for religious communication. Therefore, it must have been leisure. Eventually, um, more rock art was discovered, uh, especially in Spain. And... Um, there was a Spanish aristocrat and scholar who made the link of, hey, I'm finding this really old rock art on the ceiling of this cave, and I'm finding extremely old stone tools um, in the same cave. The people that made these very old stone tools probably made this rock art. This was, this was a groundbreaking thought. And in fact, he was, he was ridiculed. It was considered a vulgar joke by a hack artist. Um, the idea being that the People that made these stone tools, no way could have had the sophistication to also create art. Of course, today we know that's that's far different. And it wasn't until around the early 1900s that it was really accepted, especially in Europe, that early primitive man, if you will, was also capable of creating art. Um, we see a, a, simi a similar track in North America. That's what we'll really talk about quite a bit tonight. But really, rock art studies in the United States have, have kind of lagged behind that of, of what was done in Europe and Australia. Um, people have long talked about rock art, which is what we'll get to here in just a couple minutes. But it really wasn't until the 1970s and 1990s that systematic studies of rock art were really undertaken. Um, around the turn of the most recent century, um, there was this, this uh, tendency to classify things 
as either um, substance, ways to live, warfare, or trade. Um, and if it wasn't any of those, it had to be religion. And I, I have to admit, this is this is the time when, when I was doing my undergrad. And, and looking back, uh, although it doesn't seem that long ago, now two decades ago, that really, now that I think about it, was really hammered into me, that things were either religious or either religion or defense. And, um, and that really created a bias in our views. But today, as we'll talk about, there's definitely a focus on connecting human ritual to the study of rock art. Okay, so here is what that all boils down to. Here is kind of my big aha. This is what I'm working on. This is the model that I'm, I'm seeing. These are the, the trend that I'm seeing and how rock art has been interpreted and studied and recorded um, in, in the American Southwest. Um, we have phase one, which is um, ignoring or not accepting the age of images or that these images even exist. Phase two is acknowledging that there are images, but they are crude or meaningless. Phase three is that images are seen as a bridge to a Western style alphabet. Phase, phase four is a storytelling phase where images are taken at very face value and have a literal meaning that can be decoded. Phase five is now incorporating, um, being careful to incorporate a non-Western slash European bias, especially when it comes to looking at abstract images and also really taking to, into account the image in their natural setting. And finally, phase six, where I think we are now and where we are heading toward in the future is a, is a multicultural understanding of rock art panels and acknowledgement of ritual and past and current use. So for me, this, this captures 500 years of studying rock art. For me, this is 500 different views of what rock art is, what rock art means, how rock art has been discussed and how rock art has been used. So let's break that down a little bit. Some of the earliest records of rock art in the American Southwest come from this site, a place called El Moro, which is in northern New Mexico. If you've never been, I, I highly, highly, highly recommend it. If you're at all interested in rock art, you need to put El Moro high on your list. Um, it's near Zuni and Acoma, so you can make a nice long trip out of it. Um, El Moro had a Zuni village on top of that, that very prominent cliff face um, from 1275 to 1350. Um, it was first recorded by the Spanish in 1583. And eventually we start getting expeditions, uh, Spanish and American expeditions passing through, making just beautiful inscriptions. The oldest one dates from April of 1605. So we're predating the pilgrims. Um, and this is by Don Juan Onate talking about an expedition that he's returning from, from the Sea of Cortez. And when you go to El Moro, it is again, just, just fascinating. The image on the upper left there, you can see extremely old Zuni images uh, and other Puebloan images. And as you go down, you can see um, some, some US Army inscriptions from 1866. Um, you can see other immigration trains moving through. And then the lower right hand image is one of the older Spanish inscriptions. Um, you can see passed through here at the very beginning. And so El Moro creates this, this phase one for me. This is that, that first phase where rock art is really either not recorded or acknowledged. The Spanish that came through here had no problems adding their name to the own, and they really recorded that site as theirs with little acknowledgement to the rock art that was there before. Dominguez and Escalante, I think, uh, really capture that phase two. So we go from essentially ignoring rock art. And, and let, me, let me back up a little bit and talk about that. Even, even really prestigious explorers like Lewis and Clark had to have passed by countless rock art sites, but their diaries are very scant in mentioning it. Um, and a lot of these early expeditions, both Spanish and, and other um, European power base, uh, make very few mentions to rock art in the, in the earliest years. And I've, I've really been trying to reflect on why that is. And, and I think a lot of it is, is again, just this, this bias, just this phase that we have of either not understanding what we see or just flat out ignoring what we see. 
Um, but it is striking in the very beginning how, how detailed of journals we can find with very little related to rock art. And so again, I think that that's that first phase of, of early recordings, early Western recordings, basically ignoring rock art altogether. Dominguez and Escalante, though, a very famous expedition here in Western Colorado, or, or I should say famous in Western Colorado, um, famous throughout the entire American West. They left Santa Fe looking for a route to Monterey, California. Um, they left Santa Fe on July 29th, 1776. Came north past um, uh, very close to um, Delta, uh, near Natarita, over by Paonia. Um, eventually, they end up in, near Rangeley and um, make their way into Utah before they decide to turn back due to, uh, due to snow. And they, they cast lots to, uh, to, to find out from, um, from a higher authority their best result. They cross the Colorado River in November of 1776 and then return to Santa Fe on July 2nd, 1777. They have one of the earliest actual records of rock art. So again, Onate there at El Moro, he did a great job of leaving his name, but he didn't really record other rock art being there. Whereas Dominguez and Escalante have a, a nice little paragraph. Halfway down this canyon toward the south, there's a very high cliff on which we saw crudely painted three shields or chamels and the blade of a lance. Further down on the north side, we saw another painting which crudely represents two men fighting. For this reason, we call this valley Canyon Pintado. Canyon Pintado, of course, is the, the canyon just south of Rangeley, once you get over Douglas Pass, and it truly is filled with rock art, and it's, it's a very accessible rock art um, um, area to go explore. There's some great guides online and some roadside signs, and you can go and visit. This is, this is more than likely the, uh, the site that Dominguez and Escalante were talking about with the three round shields and the man with the lace. So here's that phase two. We're, we're acknowledging that rock art is here. Explorers are starting to write about rock art or the presence of rock art. But you'll notice that they, they really get in that these are crudely done. And um, they, they mention crudely in two sentences in a row. So um, not, a, not a very flattering um, for writing of rock art. One of my, my favorite exploration um, stories to, to talk about is, is John Wesley Powell's trip down the Colorado River. This would come a century later, um, almost a century later. So in 1869, John Wesley Powell leaves Green River, Wyoming, and he makes his way down what's now the Green River to the confluence of the Colorado, well, what's now the Colorado and the Green River, and uh, it continues down the Colorado River, goes through um, the Grand Canyon. John Wesley Powell was, was a very detailed journalist. I, I love reading Powell's diaries. He, uh, he has a very nice writing style and really does a great job writing about what all he sees. But in all the 1869 expedition, he only records three different rock art sites. And having retraced many, many, many miles of that trip on the river, he passed by so much. And so again, this is that, I think, hybrid of we're either not seeing or not conscious or not putting value on finding rock art. And that next phase of, okay, well, we see rock art, but it doesn't really mean much or it's very crude. So this is, um, this is Powell's um, second of three writings on rock art on this trip. We entered a canyon today with low red walls. A short distance behind its head, we discovered the ruins of an old building on the left wall. On the face of the cliff, under the building, and along down the river, for two or three hundred yards, there are many etchings. Two hours are given to the examination of these interesting ruins, then we head down 15 miles further and discover another group. Here I stand, where these now long lost people stood centuries ago, and look over this strange country. I gaze off to great mountains, and in the northwest, I, I, excuse me, I graze, I gaze off to great mountains in the northwest, which are slowly covered by the light until they are lost, and then I return to camp. Well, Powell doesn't write much about rock art on, on his 1869 expedition. He will go on to write or, or help facilitate the writing of a lot of rock art, which we'll talk about here in just a second. 
here we see a definite transition into that that next phase of rock art is there, images are there, people are creating images, but we, we the the writers at the time, the the people talking about rock art, are not giving it much credit whatsoever. This is one of the the harshest um, things that I've, I've I've read about rock art. This is this is from a children's textbook um, from 1876. In the matter of arts, the Indian was a barbarian. The fine arts are wanting. Indian writing consists of half intelligible hieroglyphics stretched on the face of rocks or cut in the bark of trees. And then here's an exaggerated example of rock art, which, which this author claims to have deciphered to, um, to claim that they were eating a turtle in a prairie hen after they come across a, 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 a group of eight soldiers, including a captain, a secretary, and a geologist. So again, um, I think this is that early phase. By the way, I've searched high and low over the last year to find what this is actually an image of. If, if this is a painting somewhere, if this actually is carved somewhere, and I've yet to come across it, um, I really question if this is even a real panel that we're looking at. I'd be really curious to find that. But then as time goes on, we start entering that, that third phase of we will accept, writers will accept that there is rock art, that rock art um, is, is widespread throughout the Americas and that rock art must be this hybrid in between um, images that are representational and an alphabet like hieroglyphics. And so this is, this is kind of what, what became of Powell after his journey. Um, in 1877, he goes on to, uh, to become the first founder of the Bureau of Ethnology. Um, so a government agency that's going out to try to answer some of these questions. And this is um, a very interesting book. If You can find this online. Um, but this is the, the Bureau of Ethnology's 10th Annual Report, which covers... Um, which covers the, the exact title is the uh, picture writing of the American Indians. And it is several hundred pages from all across the country. And again, though, we, we don't get a flattering view. We're starting to get a true study of rock art, but this is, this is essentially the conclusions that this report makes. The importance of the study of picture writing depends partly on the result of its examination as a phase in the evolution of human culture. As the invention of alphabet, alphabetic writing is admitted to be a great step marking the change from barbarianism to civilization, the story of its earliest development must be valuable. Um, if it is interfered, that if, excuse me, if it is inferred that picture writing precedes and precedes the graphic systems of Egypt and China, but in the Americas, especially North America, it is still in its current use. The execution of the drawings of which several forms of picture writings are composed often exhibit the first crude efforts of graphic art and the study in that relation of its value. And the final big conclusion is that it is not probable that, that much valuable information will ever be obtained from ancient rock carvings or paintings, but they're an important indicator of the grades of culture reached by the authors. So that's what I mean that we've entered this almost third phase. Um, and this third phase is that the people that created rock art were trying to develop an alphabet. They, they show an intelligence to move toward an alphabet but they don't get there. And, and again, the, these, are, these are the words of, of this study, not mine, of course. But again, that shows a different phase with how people are using rock art. We've gone from these are crude images to now these are images attempting to be like our alphabet, but they're not quite there yet. And so pretty soon though, we'll enter in yet another phase. Once, the, I think the next phase after this is, is this idea that the images that we see in rock art are there simply for storytelling. And I think that, um, I think that's where we're going to, to stay for quite a while um, as, as a society. And I think that for a long time, people that look at rock art 
start looking at it not so much as an alphabet once we enter this next phase, but rather as something that can be deciphered on a literal value, that when we see these representational images, we must find meaning through them. And so locally, one of my favorite areas to study um, is the Shavano Valley. And, and what I mean by favorite areas to study is I love studying how this, this rock art panel has been interpreted in different ways over, um, over time. Um, I've come across uh, newspaper articles dating back to the Shavano Valley back to 1897, talking about, about some of the images just more or less in passing. But we get a, an interesting series of articles about this very rock around 1907. Um, and you can read some of a, a here on your screen, but essentially in 1907, um, um, one of the, the articles talks about some woman has come up from the east to the Shavano Valley and says she has read the story of the Indian pictures on the rock down there. She has one distinct advantage. No one knows whether she has read them or not, or if she has, rather she has read them correctly. Eventually she comes up with a story, which I have yet to be able to track down, but I'm interested in. And this story eventually went on to um, another archeologist um, uh, who then writes back um, saying, thank you for the clipping from the Montrose Press. Uh, this is written October 18th, 1907. The alleged interpretation of the pictograph figures to be the rankest fraud. I am unable to understand how men who care anything at all of their standings among fellow men can venture to utter such uncontrollable fakes upon the public. I assure you, I never criticize thus savagely the utterance of any man if there is in it, but even a vestige of an attempt to learn or express the truth. So here we can see, um, here at Shavano, we can see a number of people coming, trying to put their own story on this rock, trying to read it like you would read a picture book saying um, we can follow the story if you go clockwise across the rock or if you read it from top to bottom or up to down and we get a number of different views as far as what this rock means. And again, in this phase, we're looking at things very literal. And then one of my, my other great examples of this phase of, of looking at images that are, are, are to be taken at only face value is taken from the Conkey Ranch. This is outside of Vernal, Utah, another great rock art area to go and visit. It's on private land, but um, there, there are ways to, to access it. They have a parking area there. And this is, a, a, I think, one of the most impressive rock art um, panels in all of North America. This is about 30 feet up on a top of a cliff. These images are life-size, if not larger. And the view, um, at least from one author, um, in the 1960s was this. Um, there's a small booklet that was written called The Last Arrow in 1966. In it, this, this um, amateur archeologist presumes that these images are Egyptian and he writes an entire story um, to be taken serious around this idea that these images did not come from the people that were here before but rather these are clearly Egyptian and he writes about a great war between the different parties. But in 1977, things take a major change. And, and in North America, in, in Southwest archeology, span this is critical. This is where we see that shift into um, our last two phases as far as how rock art is viewed. And I think this is one of the most critical um, moments in, in the history of studying rock art. On summer solstice of 1977, um, an artist by the name of Anna Safar is on top of this butte in Chaco Canyon. This is called Fajada Butte. And she is up there recording rock art um, and she sees a couple of spirals. And again, remember what, what I have noticed in, in my research is that abstract images are largely ignored up to this point. Um, or abstract images are seen as hieroglyphics or seen as a bridge to an alphabet. And then usually ignored as or passed off as um, this idea of this is just kids making doodles or, or graffiti. But Anna Safar goes up here and, and she sees a couple of spires. So, so abstract images. Um, spirals do not occur in nature necessarily, so she starts recording them. 
And she happens to be up there right near the, the solstice, the longest day of the year, when the sun is to its furthest point north on the horizon. And when she's up there, she notices that these boulders um, create these, these gaps, or, or I should say there's gaps in between these boulders that create these daggers of light. And in the middle, as you can see, um, on summer solstice, um, these daggers of light, these, these little windows uh, created by the boulders, will send a shaft of light that, that perfectly bisects the larger of the spirals during, during the summer solstice. And then on equinox, um, the, the two days uh, during the year when, when the equal amount of light and darkness, um, the smaller spiral, there's a smaller spiral on the upper left, gets bisected by a sun dagger. And then on winter solstice, the largest of the two daggers is flint. And this is what it looks like um, on summer solstice. To me, this is a pivotal moment in, in the historiography of rock art. This now all of a sudden makes us realize, hey, there's, there's something more to these abstract images. We, we need to reframe how we are even looking at rock art. And I, I think that this moment has been really, really critical for, for interpreting rock art everywhere. What the research at Fahad Butte led to was, was looking at images like, like this one, also found at Chaco Canyon, and also uh, this image. And there is now a new big trend in archaeology, um, in especially the study of rock art, of looking at um, archaeoastronomy. That is how, uh, how rock art sites and even larger features are used to, to interpret the night sky. Both the past two images that I showed you now are, are believed, um, a theory is that these could be from the Crab uh, Nebula supernova of 1054. When the Crab Nebula went to supernova, when, when that star blew up, it was the, uh, the third brightest thing in the sky, just behind the sun and the moon. It could be seen during the day. We have accounts from China um, uh, real extensively about seeing this, this new second sun appear during the day. I have no doubt that the people at Chaco saw this as well, and now we can start seeing this incorporated in their art. And then we start really examining if, if they are this, this tide, the people at Chaco, if they are that tied to the night sky, if they're putting it in their art, maybe they're taking it on an even larger level. And so we can start looking at the architecture at Chaco Canyon. And of the major buildings in Chaco, five of them are built to be in different solar alignments, and seven are built to be in different lunar alignments. And so what this does, this, this enters us into that, that sixth phase, as I call it. This is where now we are looking at images in, in, a, in a whole new way, especially abstract images. We're now not trying to say these are crude images. We are now not saying that these are images that, um, that are just a, a bridge to be more like Western civilization. Instead, we're saying these are images that serve a function. And now we need to shift focus and say, what, well, what is this function? We're obviously not understanding. We came in with a different bias. There's that, that famous saying about how if you judge a fish, how well it climbs a tree, it, it'll never succeed, right? And I think that almost every, not every, but almost every interpretation of rock art up to this point or close to this point was judging a fish on how well it could climb a tree. If you just see a spiral and have no idea that this is a very complex solar calendar, you're going to ignore it. You're going to move past it. You're going to say that this is just a crude image or you're going to say this is just kids doing nothing. But once we change our understanding of rock, what rock art can be, once we change our understanding of, of the ways that rock art is used, then it starts opening up a whole new world. And that's where I think that we've started to enter. So now when we look at an image like this, we're starting to incorporate new ideas, especially into the abstract images here. This is at Dominguez Creek, a site that I'm sure many of you have hiked to. And now, as I mentioned, in this final phase of understanding rock art, we're making a, a conscious effort of asking the people who use rock art today the ancestors of those that created it, and again, those that are still using rock art in their everyday lives today, what does this mean? And that, that seems like such an obvious thing to do, but it's taken us almost 500 years to get there. 
And so this, this rock art panel, um, a local archeologist, Carol Patterson, interviewed a youth elder, Clifford Duncan, a number of years ago. What we could easily pass off as a very bizarre image, I've heard this called a scorpion, I've heard it called part of the cactus. Um, Clifford Duncan's interpretation of this is that this is showing um, the, the forced removal of the Utes out of Western Colorado. Um, that you can see uh, several different people on horseback, some representing U.S. Army soldiers, and the large image in the middle could very well be Fort Defiance. And we are even seeing this at Chavano Valley, that, that first rock art, or not the first, but one of the panels that I talked about earlier about how outside of Montrose, people have been going down there trying to create stories based off of what they see. Well, actually talking to the people that created rock art or their ancestors or people that use rock art, the new understanding is that this is the image on the, the left, the images on the left, are depicting the bear dance, a, a very sacred social dance for the Utes. And now we're really going off onto a number of new ideas and experimental ideas. Um, Dr. Patterson has suggested that the image on the right is a topographical map of the area. And so now instead of looking at abstract images as far as who knows, since I don't understand what it means, it must mean nothing. Now we're trying to really try to understand that would this mean something? And we're still trying to figure out what that something means. So to kind of sum up, because I know that was a lot, a lot at once. Let's kind of go over again what I, I think the different phases of writing about and using rock art in North America have been. I think we have that first phase of not accepting the age of images or accepting the images are there at all. And again, this is what we saw with Onate and El Moro. Um, far more interested in recording their history than recording the history that was already there. This is what we see in expeditions like Lewis and Clark, um, very detailed, but I, I, I wonder if this was even in their realm as something to consider even looking at and examining. And then we enter that phase two, which I think we start getting captured by people like Powell, some of these um, expeditions in that time period, which, which we see that they're there, but oftentimes they're recorded as either crude or meaningless. And excuse me, I would say that that's definitely what Dominguez and Escalante talked about. And then Powell's Bureau of Ethnology really focused on this, the idea that they're being seen as a bridge to a Western style alphabet. Again, they're no longer viewed as crew, but this is more of an idea of, well, how can we show that this rock art is an attempt to be more like us in a Western bias? Phase four is what you saw in Chavano Valley, the, the earliest ones, and also the, uh, the very colorful, interesting story about um, uh, McConkey Ranch, and that's a storytelling phase that, that you see a lot of in the beginning of the 20th century when you read accounts. And that is people going through really trying to read rock art, especially representational images, basically ignoring abstract images. And then I think Anna Safar and her work at Fajada Butte really propelled us into this fifth phase where we're moving away from our Western bias. We're moving away from this idea of it has to fit our mold and our understanding. Otherwise, it's gibberish. And now we're saying, wow, this spiral can be a calendar. Um, there's, and then that, that has just exploded this entire new understanding of rock art, of what it can be. And again, I, I also think we're kind of now entering the sixth phase of really going through and understanding the role of ritual, understanding the role of place, and really acknowledging that rock art is something that is still in use. It's not something that was abandoned. And so that's that's kind of, a, a, in a nutshell, the historiography of, um, of, of rock art in the American Southwest. And again, this is something that is, is still a little bit new. Um, I've been scouring early, early diaries and journals of explorers trying to find mentions of rock art. Even people like uh, Captain Gunnison that came through this area in, in the 1850s write very little about rock art. Hayden writes very little about rock art. And so, again, I'm not trying to write about what they saw or interpreted. Um, 
excuse me, I'm not trying to write about the rock art that they saw, rather how they saw rock art or if they even saw rock art. So it's been interesting. Um, I, I think there's still a lot to flesh out in there, but it's an interesting way of, of looking at rock art. And to go back to this again really quick, Sadly, I think that a lot of us are, are still stuck in some of these thoughts. Um, I, the number of times that I hear, oh, this is just kids going off because they're bored, or, oh, they're, they're trying to create an alphabet and we need to create, we need to backtrack this alphabet. Um, these are still very much in our, our um, society today. This is still very much how a lot of people view rock art. And so one of the things that I'm really trying to do is get people to understand that, that there's so much more to this, that, that we need to change how we view rock art and how we study rock art. So the final little bit, I'm, I'm down to just another couple minutes though, but one of the other things that I wanted to talk to you guys about is some of the, the new frontiers in studying and understanding rock art. And these are just a couple that, um, that I've been really trying to follow lately. Um, the first is, is using a, uh, a classic technique um, of examining Renaissance paintings to try to understand who all is creating rock art. Uh, Giovanni Morelli um, developed a series in the 1870s of, of trying to identify either unsigned paintings to figure out who painted it or to look for forgeries. And what he really noticed is that artists will go to um, really common idiosyncrasies when it comes to things like drawing ears and fingers and hands and feet, especially in background figures. So not so much when you're making a portrait of somebody, but if you look at the people in the background, an artist is going to start drawing all the ears the same way and all the hands the same way and all the feet the same way or their, their brush strokes are going to be similar. And this is something that's been used since the 1870s in modern art. Well, they've, they've fairly recently started doing this, especially with Australian rock art. And so what they've been able to do is go into some caves in, a, in Australia, and they've, they've seen this image in, in a number of places. And even though this image is far apart, um, these two images are far apart from each other in the cave, and even though they were definitely painted at different dates, um, using this system, the, the authors of this paper have concluded that this was the same artist that created this. So in other words, this is proof that an artist came back to the same site and added to a panel in a different location in the same site. By contrast, we have these two images of fish and using the, the Morellian art classification, these were probably done by two different artists, just looking at, um, at some overall structure and, and um, brush strokes and things like that. So I, I think that that's a real fascinating aspect that I, I've yet to see incorporated in, um, in rock art in, uh, in the West, but I, I look forward to seeing that. That'd be really fascinating to, to break down. Another cutting edge science that's being used right now is lead testing. So remember I mentioned um, uh, Dominguez and Escalante crossed back over the Colorado River as they're heading south out of Utah, heading back towards Santa Fe. Um, when Glen Canyon was, was exposed, when Lake Powell was so low um, several years back, this inscription was found passed through here in 1776. And so the Park Service really questioned, is this authentic? Um, is this really a Dominguez and Escalante marker? It was known that Dominguez and Escalante crossed the river near there. That area is actually called Crossing of the Fathers, but nobody had really seen this rock art before. So a study was done where they, they chipped off a tiny amount of, of uh, the, the rock art and a tiny amount of pigmentation nearby and they actually looked at the composition of lead found um, within the, those samples. And they were able, this, this group was able to classify lead, the presence of lead into three different areas, three different time periods. One type of lead left a signature if it was created after the introduction of automobiles in, in the area. So, um, you know, lead gasoline being burnt off, that exhaust will, will coat everything eventually with this type of lead. 
There's another type of lead that comes in between the late 19th century or early 20th century um, as we start getting into the industrialized age. Um, so starting or ending about, excuse me, starting at about 1850, going until the introduction of um, automobiles in the area, you can find a second type of lead. And then there's a third type of lead composition that can be found during what is referred to as the Little Ice Age, which occurred between 1550 and 1850. And so scientists were able to analyze some of the lead found off of this carving, and the lead was what they'd expect to find being, being deposited during that Little Ice Age. So they were able to prove that this was most likely carved in between 1850 and 1550. So this wasn't something modern like, like this jerk up here. This probably actually was carved during that time period. It was most likely carved before 1850. So it's a fascinating study, um, really neat ideas. It is a little invasive, it is a little bit destructive, but this idea that we are now looking at environmental clues um, that can be found on the surface of rock art panels and, and using that to date is, is really amazing. Um, the reverse was true in this paper. They found an image that they proved to be a forgery because um, the lead that they found most likely matched what was found in um, gasoline motors um, in the area. So they were able to prove that that um, rock art panel is probably carved in the 1920s. And finally, this is a, a really common um, new frontier in rock art that I know a lot of you are probably familiar with. Um, it's commonly referred to as D-stretch, but it's this idea that you can change the hue and intensity of either red, green, or blue colors and have so many more details come out. Uh, digital photography has really, really changed rock art. And D-Stretch has been around for quite a while. Um, it was actually invented by, uh, by NASA uh, to use for imaging on Mars. Um, and now it's been really commonplace in the rock art world. And why I mention this is, is because you can download the software onto your phone. If you just look for D-Stretch in any app store, um, you can actually get this on your phone and you can be there in the field and you can hold your camera up to a panel and you will start seeing more than the naked eye can see. And so there's some really, really neat things going on with how we're, uh, we're, how we're understanding rock art. So um, again, um, what I really wanted to, to share tonight is that how we have recorded and viewed rock art has changed greatly over the last 500 years, and I think it still continues to change. Um, and I think that there's some really neat new frontiers with, with what we're doing with rock art as far as how to study it um, even more, especially using things like uh, imaging, using things like uh, analyzing chemicals found, and also even using systems like trying to figure out systematically how many artists came to us uh, at once. So that's all that I have for tonight. I guess we'll turn it on over for questions or I'll turn it back over to Stephanie. All right, I'll hop on here and I'll see if there's any questions in chat, but thank you so much for that, Zeb. That was really interesting. It's amazing to me to think that people would just ignore rock art because I love to, when I'm hiking, I just love seeing that. I'm always in awe of that, especially when I first went to Canyon Pintado. Mm -hmm. It's so beautiful up there. So how can you ignore that? Yeah, um, so you know what? Oh, really quick, I've, I've just kind of wrap a little bit. I've, I've been thinking about that a lot. And um you know, I, I think the best that I can compare it to, and I hope Julia's still on because she'll she'll like this. I hope um, when I when I first moved back to the Grand Valley, I I did a lot of hiking, but I didn't care about geology like at all. Like geology meant nothing to me. Like a rock is either shiny or it's dull or it's hard or it's made out of sand, and that was my extent of geology. But now that I've gotten into geology. And now that I go on those same hikes, it's like I'm seeing things all over again. And I think that that is what we're seeing in those early days. It's, it's amazing what we miss. And I, I've been thinking a lot about our own bias and, and how we put blinders on. And I think right now, like, I, I'm that same way with birds. Like, when I go on a hike now, well, there's a blackbird, and, well, that one's kind of blue, and that one has a, a red 
grasp. And that's about the extent of my birding knowledge. But the more that I get into ornithology, the more that I start to understand it, the more that I see. And so I wonder if early explorers were in that same trap. It's the, we don't understand this. This is not within our world. So we might not see it. Like they maybe literally did not see it or really have any value to assign to it. Yeah, and so Julia can't find the chat feature, so she just texted me, but I just, in case anybody else is missing the chat feature, it's above the list of attendees. Just go in there and you can type, but I'll, I'll translate on my phone. So Julia says that it was an awesome talk and thank you for giving it. And she wants to know if it was really geology or looking for Allosaurus. Oh, see, looking for Allosaurus is what got me interested in <laughs> geology. So um, nice try, Julia. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that that's an, an interesting. Um, again, just just to go off of that um, until we get another question or two, um, it's amazing what we miss, right? It, it, in our everyday life, it's amazing what we miss. Um, I think about that with architecture a lot, right? Like I, I've done um, tours of, of Seventh Street with somebody who's an architectural master, and, and it's like, wow, I've walked by this building a thousand times. And and so it's interesting looking at these these writings, it's looking at how rock art has been written about to see, wow, we either missed a lot or we used it as a way to say that you're not where we are as far as having an alphabet or civilization. But again, we're looking for the wrong thing and that's what you're comparing it to. Yeah, it's such a Eurocentric view and other cultures mm -hmm. have vastly different ways of going about things. I mean, even if you look at you know, the, the, the languages in Asia, how they have different ways of writing their language and expressing themselves or just language in general. So to assume that people here in the Southwest who existed pre-Europeans would be wanting to aspire to that is just a kind of ridiculous thought, but that's how people thought in the day, so. And sadly, that's at least how they, they wrote. And, and so again, uh, again, if you guys have questions, please chime in. But again, that's one of the things that I, I really wanted to to capture in this is is this idea that man we're, we're we're sometimes missing the point of what rock art was and and so when we're looking at it with the wrong lens it's it's always going to be something crude but when we start looking at it for what it truly is it's 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 amazing it, it's simply simply a, astonishing what what all is done and, and what we're learning today anything else from anyone doesn't look like anything's coming in, so. Yeah, you, you must have just wowed them. I know I was wowed, that was fantastic. So thank you so much. Oh, let's see, we've got we've got two popping in right now. So um, Mark says, thank you for such an interesting information, informative talks all this week. Um, Jessa says you did such a great job explaining. And Justin says, fascinating stuff, thanks. So I think everyone's just, just taking it all in. Oh, great. So I guess in, in closing and in, in parting, I would say, you know, as you go out and, and explore rock art, one, make sure to rock, visit rock art responsibly. So so do not add to it. I mean, you, you saw that image of that beautiful Dominguez and Escalante panel with him carving from 1994 over the top of it. I mean, that, that just boils my blood to say the least. So, so visit rock art with respect, you know, avoid graffiti at all cost. Um, be careful the, the ground around it. Um, and also if, if you go and, and take photos of these remote rock art sites, uh, and if you want to post those on Instagram or Facebook, try to remove the geotagging from your stuff before you post it. So, so those are a couple of critical things. But two, keep in mind on this talk and, and really kind of ask yourself like, where is, oops, sorry, I keep on pulling up the screens thinking you guys can see them. Where are you on these these different phases, right? Are, are As you're visiting rock art, are you seeing this as a failed attempt at an alphabet? Are you seeing these as images that have no meaning? Are you seeing these as something that has to be a story that's obviously read? Or are you understanding that, wow, rock art is something that's still used today. It, it, it's extremely complex and that we need to reframe our understanding the, as we visit rock art sites. So, so that'd be my, my closing is that even though I'm trying to look at how rock art is written at a, a larger level, we can incorporate this in our everyday life too.
Well, thank you so much, Sub. Cindy just chimed in saying thank you for an excellent presentation, and I have to agree with her. So I, I'm I'm excited. I have a lot to think about now, and I'm going to have a new appreciation for rock art when I go out and hike and find it. So thank you. Well, great. Well, thank you, guys, and thank you to the museum for hosting these, and I uh, hope everyone has a wonderful evening. So thank yeah. you all. And before everybody heads out, I just want to remind you, we have um, some events at Cross Orchards through the end of the month. So um, on Saturdays, we have our fall season days. So if you want to come by, there's, um, I believe the farmer's market is from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. There's hay rides, mountain man demonstrations, um, all sorts of other educational demonstrations. I think there's still space in our, our craftsman workshops on the 24th. So do check that out. Um, this is the end of Earth Science Week for this year, but hopefully we'll see you all next year. So thank you so much, Zeb, and thanks for everyone for um, attending.